Hi, this is Dr. Matthew J. Trom from Engineer Inc. And uh, I'm going to give you a lecture today from our fluid mechanics course. The lecture is entitled Uncertainty Analysis in Experimental Measurement. Uh, there's going to be four lecture outcomes that we'll address in this presentation. Uh, the first is I'm going to articulate to you the role of measurement uncertainty in experimental results. That's typically in the reporting of engineering experimental results. Second is I'm going to describe to you and compare two different approaches to determine uh, uncertainty in experimental measurements. Uh, third, I'm going to focus in on one of those two approaches, which is a statistical approach, and I'm going to show you the mathematical underpinnings of the statistical analysis. And finally, I'm going to define for you something called a confidence interval and how you use it uh, in reporting uncertainty. So the place where this story really starts um, is this idea that engineers are quite interested in measuring and modeling reality. We really like to know what's going on in a particular system or process that we're interested in. Um, and the way that we get at reality is through two approaches. One is theory, the other one is measurement. Um, with respect to engineering theory, um, what we'll do is develop a relatively simple model that uh, hopefully accurately describes what's happening in reality. Now the challenge here is that reality is very complicated and engineering theories are typically not um, complicated enough to capture all of the intricacies of reality. And so to connect reality to theory, we make a series of engineering assumptions, simplifying assumptions that simplify reality down to the point that the theory uh, is a accurate and applicable representation. And this usually works pretty well, provided the reality of the situation obeys our engineering assumptions. Now, an example that I'll give you here is the ideal gas law, uh, which you should be familiar with from your previous physics and chemistry classes. The ideal gas law, uh, when used in engineering, relates the pressure, temperature, and density of a gas um, and allows an engineer to run the gas through a series of thermodynamic processes to determine how the temperature, density, and pressure uh, will respond and change um, as it's run through those thermodynamic processes. Um, the ideal gas law is a great approximation to reality provided the gas that we're modeling is highly rarefied. That means that the volume of the gas molecule is very small, approaching 0% um, of the overall volume taken up by the gas. Provided those molecules don't take up any volume and don't interact with each other, the ideal gas law is an excellent representation of real gases. Now, things start to become problematic and break down when the gas gets compressed. When you compress a gas, all of a sudden the volume of the individual gas molecules takes up an appreciable fraction of the total volume occupied by the gas, and those gas molecules start to interact with each other and cause the ideal gas law to break down. So our compressed real gas no longer follows our engineering assumptions and our theory, the ideal gas law, to approximate the behavior of the gas starts to break down and become invalid. On the other side of the ledger, we have engineering measurement. Now, no matter how much money you spend and no matter how good your measurement um, instruments are, it is virtually impossible to take an experimental measurement and get the exact, precise, uh, error-free value of what's happening in the real um, process or system that you're trying to measure. And so to connect reality to our experimental measurements, we attempt to determine the magnitude of the uncertainty of our instruments and our measurement process. So the uncertainty is really a range that's wrapped around the experimental measurement. And the idea is that if we've calculated the uncertainty correctly, the reality of whatever process or system we're trying to measure falls within the range of the uncertainty wrapped around the measurement. So that's really what we're going for. Now, uh, the next couple of slides, I'm going to describe um, how to calculate uh, this uncertainty value um, and how to report it as you're writing, for example, laboratory reports. Um, so there are actually two approaches to determine measurement uncertainty. The first approach um, is to take repeat identical measurements and to take enough of them that you can run um, statistical analysis and calculate an average and a standard deviation. The second approach is to determine the measurement uncertainty of an instrument, typically from the manufacturer, and I will talk about that one uh, in more detail in another set of lecture notes. Uh, we won't talk about it here. Um, so let's let's go back to the 
the first one. Um, what I really want to emphasize here is this word identical. You want to take identical measurements. That typically means it's the same person taking the same measurement on the same system with the same measurement device in a very limited span of time. You want to make sure that the system itself is not changing with respect to time, that the environmental conditions are not changing, that the measurement is truly an identical measurement, one after the other after the other. If the measurements are not identical measurements, then this entire process goes out the window. So be sure and be confident when you're doing this that you are taking identical uh, experimental measurements. Now, how many measurements do you need? Um, typically, to start to get um, a, a population that you can run statistics on, you need at least 10 measurements. And from an engineering perspective, uh, we want a few more than that. So the next number after 10 is 11. So at least for purposes of this class, we'll usually take 11 experimental measurements and assume that that is sufficient to run uh, the needed statistical analysis to calculate experimental uncertainty. So uh, let me show you how to do that. <clears throat> There are um, some benefits and some drawbacks to this repeated measurement approach. The benefits uh, are first, well, you've now got a population that you can calculate an average and a standard deviation for, and those are accurate and valid. Um, and so you have a statistically accurate uncertainty that you've calculated and can use with a great level of confidence. Um, so, so that's very important. Um, second is that if you do that other approach that I talked about, go to the manufacturer and find out um, either from their um, packaging of their instruments or the manual of their instruments or the product website or calling the manufacturer to determine the uncertainty of the instrument, um, they will typically give you a larger value of uncertainty in the measurement than uh, is really accurate. And the reason for that um, is because they're very squeamish and sometimes concerned about liability. So they want to make sure that the uncertainty is large enough that the reality falls within the range of the measured value plus the uncertainty that they give you. So they tend to give you very large uncertainty values. Um, so it turns out if you do this statistical uh, approach of repeated measurements, you usually get um, a smaller value for experimental uncertainty than if you go to the manufacturer and ask them to directly. Uh, and usually smaller uncertainties are better um, because they help to uh, illuminate um, unknown aspects of the process that you're measuring. So you usually want to get uh, small uncertainties. Um, and it turns out that, that if you use this technique, you can actually run instruments beyond the stated range uh, that the manufacturer gives you. You can measure things more precisely um, or out of range based on uh, the manufacturer's specification. So this is actually a very powerful positive component of using uh, repeated statistical analysis. The negative, of course, is that it's costly in terms of time and resources to take the same measurement over and over and over and over again. Um, so you as the engineer have to decide if you have the time and the resources and often the money that's required to set up the same experiment and run it over and over and over again and take the same measurement over and over and over again, and then whether you have the computational power to process those data and run statistical analyses on them. So that's up to you as the engineer, but if you're confident that you have the resources and the capabilities, um, the process from a mathematical standpoint is just statistical analysis. So we'll move into that now. So again, we're taking um, 11 measurements. Again, 10 plus 1 gives a statistically uh, meaningful number. So uh, the number of measurements n is 11 for our purposes. Um, again, the more measurements you take, the more costly it is in terms of time, money, and processing power. So that's up to you. But provided you've done this and taken your 11 or more measurements, um, the first thing you do is calculate the average value of those measurements using this formula. And I will give an example of this, not in these slides, but on the course website so you can see how it's done. Uh, but this is just a, an averaging formula. So you calculate the average value and the average value is actually now the reported experimental value that you get from this process. What about the experimental uncertainty? Well, to determine the experimental uncertainty, we first need to calculate the standard deviation. And here is a formula for the standard deviation. Again, I would give an example in on the course website to show how this is done. But here is the formula uh, for reference. Um, now, once you calculate the standard deviation, it's important to know really what the standard deviation means and how it relates to uncertainty so you can choose the right magnitude to report uh, in your um, uncertainty analysis.
So what I show here um, is a normal distribution. Um, we assume as we're taking measurements that the measurements contain random errors and uh, random errors will change uh, the measured value away from the actual real value by you know some little portion to the left which is higher or to the right which is lower um, and so here in the middle is the the mean value the average value of all of the the data that we've taken and then um, along the x-axis these are values that are larger than the mean by one two or three standard deviations and values that are lower than the mean by one two or three standard deviations and then here on the y-axis we have the frequency of measurement so how often those measurements show up and as you would expect um, because random errors are typically very small, the closer you get to the mean, the more frequent um, a particular measurement is, hence the peak in the normal distribution here, uh, right where the mean is. So how do we use standard deviations to determine how should we should report experimental uncertainty? Well, if you look at this blue shaded area here, we have 34.1% below the mean and 34.1% above the mean corresponding to minus one and plus one standard deviations. So if you combine those two values, what it means is that there's a 68.2% chance that the next measurement you take, provided that it's an identical measurement, the next measurement you take has a 68.2% chance of falling from minus one to plus one standard deviations of the mean. Now that's, that's pretty good. That's a 68.2% confidence interval. That's what that means. Um, it's good enough uh, for some purposes, but for engineering purposes, we like to be more than about 70% confident that the next measurement we take is going to fall within a certain range. And so what we do is go out to two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below the mean. And by doing that, there's an extra confidence that's added in, which is 13.6% below and 13.6% above, that the next measurement is going to fall within this range. So if we take these light blue shaded areas and these dark blue shaded areas and add up the confidence of all of those from minus two standard deviations to plus two standard deviations, we end up with a 95.4% confidence. That's 95.4% confidence that the next measurement we get take is going to fall from minus two to plus two standard deviations from the mean. So that, that's pretty good. 95% chance is pretty good for most engineering analysis. If we want an even higher confidence interval, we can go to an even higher two, three, four, five standard deviations. Uh, but for our purposes, particularly in this class, we'll just use uh, two standard deviations to define um, the 95% confidence interval that determines the size of the standard deviation. So for engineering measurement, we typically report experimental uncertainty from our statistical analysis as two standard deviations. Again, that's a 95.4% confidence interval. Now that we have that figured out, we know an average value and we know the uncertainty that we're going to report, how do we actually report it in you know, lab reports uh, that, that uh, or answers to quiz questions or whatever that we might be reporting? Well, what we typically do is report measurement with uh, its uncertainty and the units in the following form. So here's the average value, plus or minus the standard deviation, and then the units. Uh, so one mistake that I see a lot of students do is that they'll report the units twice, and it's not necessary to report the units twice. So if they measure a temperature that's 100 degrees Celsius and there's an uncertainty of plus or minus 1 degree Celsius, some students will tend to actually write 100 degrees Celsius plus or minus 1 degree Celsius. That's that's uh, overkill. It's not necessary. Um, so what you'll do in that case is just write 100 plus or minus 1 degree Celsius, and that's, that's good. Good enough. Um, the other thing to worry about is reporting the number of significant digits. Uh, sometimes the uncertainty and the average value have different numbers of significant figures, um, and so you need to reconcile to make sure that uh, those significant digits are the same. So it turns out that the significant digits are controlled by the average value, so you use the inputs to the average value to determine the number of significant digits that you'll report, and then you truncate the um, reported uncertainty so it matches the decimal places that you report for the average value. So for example, if you take a temperature measurement that's say 100 degrees Celsius and it has an uncertainty of plus or minus 1.6 degrees Celsius, well, if you've got 100 degrees Celsius, the decimal place would be right there. And this uncertainty value, uh, the, the ones place, and this uncertainty value, the decimal is here and is reported out to the tenths place. That's 
too far out and this value doesn't agree with this value in terms of significant digits. And so what we'll do is truncate by rounding up. So we would report this as 100 plus or minus 2 degrees Celsius. Now rounding up is okay because you've just increased the value of the confidence interval. You should never round down. That concludes the lecture. Thank you.